Welcome to the Elder Scrolls Lorecast, the podcast where we explore the amazing universe of the Elder Scrolls. Adventurers, I step out of the shadows to bring to you news of Nocturnal. Welcome back to the Elder Scrolls Lorecast. This is your host, Tom. More robots. That was a creepy intro I did right there. I was going to say, someone's becoming a nocturnal cultist. Hey, man. Nocturnal, she's pretty freaking cool. Uh, That's Lotus, my co-host. Lotus, welcome back. But hey, it's been a little while. We took last week off. Yeah, I was going to say, it has been. And before that, we were uh, doing the Patreon episode. So it's been a couple weeks since we actually had jumped back into all of the daedric print stuff so it'll be good to pick back up where we left off as we're kind of going through the list getting down this time we are uh, up to nocturnal yeah so uh nocturnals i mean we're doing them alphabetically but nocturnal is a good one to do after namira because there are similarities they, these two get confused yeah this one's a little less gross uh, <laughs> <laughs> right right so. well here's here's a way that i've i, I did some uh, obviously researching for the episode and and one of the things that often gets discussed in the community is that nocturnal is the shadow. Namira is are the things in the shadows. If you think of it that way, it's kind of a nice distinction, right? Like the gross, sure. like terribleness stuff. Yeah, that's Namira, right? The shadow itself, the lack of light, the darkness is nocturnal. Yes. And also aesthetically uh nocturnal is pretty well known uh for as chad is referring to her does all sorts of uh things <laughs> uh, yeah definitely uh known for nocturnal's aesthetic in the series especially more as of late uh but actually as we can kind of get into all the way back to Daggerfall, she had a pretty interesting look compared to some of the other data princes yeah what, what does she look like in Daggerfall, fall lotus uh let, let's just say that she's got most of a blank it <laughs> right yeah so she's she's always been described as having her arms outstretched this is like one of the things she does and I, I don't know if that's like a reference to like shadows creeping out like in the darkness with like crows or ravens right right and, and it, then it's... the idea that she's like partly draped in like a dark piece of cloth that makes it hard to see her body but Yet in that in this imagery, like she's clearly you can clearly see bare legs underneath there. And the assumption would yeah. be that there's not a whole lot else being worn underneath no, that blanket. Um the other thing that I always find kind of interesting though, um, just I, I have no idea if it's intentional or not, but like you mentioned, the arms outstretched thing, whereas if you go to the UESP, you know, there's all sorts of photos of her. You can pretty much just Google nocturnal mm-hmm. and you'll find tons and tons of pictures of her and she always tends to have that like outstretched arms even if they're not all the way but her arms are like lifted and there's always crows or ravens like on them and it's funny because one of the things that i find very funny just from the crow perspective is that she's always in like a generic scarecrow pose all like yeah, you know, all her statues yeah. and stuff like that. So it is, it's a weird aesthetic hmm. that it's just, it's always kind of got little perches for the birds to land on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The same way that like scarecrows don't work in the real world and the, and the birds yeah, they, will just they, land on them. You totally use them as non-functional. Purchases. Yeah. Yeah. Purchase. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wonder if that's, I wonder if the scarecrow thing was intentional or not. You know, you never know. You never quite know these because you can't get behind the minds of the initial designers unless you are able to interview them um but here let's let's get into some of the details here nocturnal obviously a daedric prince because that's what we're going going for um this her her sphere she typically comes in a feminine form so we can say her but their their sphere is the night and darkness she is also known as the mistress of shadows the unfathomable mistress of shadows not just the regular mistress of shadows the shadow thief which We'll get into the Thieves Guild connection. The Unfathomable, the Empress of Merc, the Shadow Queen, the Shadow Hag, 
which might have some connection to witches, which is another yep. thing. The Lady of the Twilight, the Daughter of Twilight, the Lady of Shadows, the Mistress of Mystery. And no, that is not a Fallout reference. I was going to say, <laughs> and now for the radio drama. Right. We're gonna, we're, now we're just Fallout. spurring more uh, people to have these like connections between Fallout a and clear Elder crossover right there. She has the audio drama. So, I mean, it's it's confirmed. It's, it's confirmed. there it is. There confirmed. it is. She's, she's behind Fallout 76 confirmed. She's behind the Mistress of Mystery and the, and the yep. whole group and the <laughs> Fallout 76 around. quest line and all of that. It's all it's all not it's, it's all an elaborate ploy from Todd Howard. <laughs> of course. Of course. Uh, somebody's going to do it. Somebody probably already has a video about this and it probably has like 200,000 views. Yes, because somewhere. everybody's like, oh my God, it does. And then like five seconds and they're like, yeah, I'm just making this so. yeah 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 okay <laughs> so it, it goes on there's more uh the mother of shadows she's mother daughter all of these feminine sure, names right uh lady luck probably has something to do with thieves <laughs> yep the night mistress the prince of night and darkness and the saint of suspicion so many good titles yes it's also interesting because um we always make reference to the fact that you know prince is referred to kind of ambiguously it's just right. a title to these beings royalty um right. right and with nocturnal she always seems to take a female form um throughout the series and the myriad of titles that we just bombarded you with basically also show that as well mm -hmm. um she has a definite feminine influence compared to some of the others that are either masculine or they switch it around depending upon what's most advantageous to them or whatever but uh yeah she she seems to kind of stick with the female aesthetic going through the series yeah yeah and i i think that's partly our own cultural thing like this idea of like this the the dark shadowy like emo woman <laughs> being like a temptress you know like the temptations of darkness and all of that i think that there's probably something there this like feminine kind of thing that kind of plays into that well in our culture yeah um, so it kind of transferred over into the lore as well yeah from like a, a meta perspective but i'm sure, sure. There, are, there are lore reasons as well the other thing that's really cool about her is that she also it has been referred to by the title Erdra when we talked about that before. Yeah. And how that title signifies that maybe she's one of the original of the et Ada, one of the primordial forces, some sort of more right. foundational character than it appears just by saying she's one of this specific number of uh, Daedric princes. That yep. Maybe there's more to her than it seems. Now, she doesn't ever take on that title for herself. She typically... Does it really isn't into being worshipped much at all? Even though there no. are groups that worship her, um, she tends to be pretty like just kind of standoffish about mortals. Just kind of like, yeah, you guys do your thing, and then sometimes she gets called on by you know the thieves guild or whoever, and so she, right. she intervenes. But uh, but that's very rare with her compared to some of these others. I wonder if that has something to do with the fact that she does seem so foundational and. Um, and to, to kind of play into that, this idea that she is the darkness, she is the shadow, this connection directly back to the void. Do you have any thoughts on, on that specifically? Because it's it seems more profound and fundamental than what we discussed with like Namira. Yeah. So her tie to the void is kind of strange because there's some... I, without going too far ahead, the big thing that I, ha I, I find interesting about her is her um, her Daedric realm, um, Evergloam type of thing, mm -hmm. which has this like extreme darkness. I mean, to be fair, it kind of we, we've only gotten glimpses of it. We really haven't. Um, seen a lot of her her realm ever there's, there's a little bit of a quest line in there is elder you, scrolls online correct and you mm -hmm. will travel to ever right and Not, it's it's beautiful in it's like dark it's, darkness it really it's like super nightmare before christmas type vibe <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah um very which is which yeah. is fine uh but yeah like it, what little we've seen of it it's <clears throat> what do you call it got this like 
whole the way her creatures or her minions kind of come into existence they have this like liquid darkness they kind of like form out of Mm -hmm. so like just aesthetically right out the gate that's the same type of vibe you get from the void itself um from in games manifested blackness right like it's darkness Darkness. itself that's forming into these things which Mm -hmm. is interesting because of her kind of ties to potentially the void like and if she's an erdra <clears throat> that's back to the creation of all of this most likely again it gets a little dicey with what an erdra is because right. when were they formed did right. they make it through kalpas like yeah so yeah, there, there's I, there's references in uh, like among the Imperials and among the Khajiit yeah. in in their understanding of these things that she might be more foundational, that she may have been right. a, like a direct manifestation of Padme or the dark part of Lorcan's heart itself kind of manifest. Right. Um, there's even speculation that she may be even more foundational to that, like she might be the darkness somehow that was between uh padme and um uh uh the other the other one order and chaos uh ada or no um what's the what's the other one what's the other word words are falling out of my brain i i I lost Um, you on that one (laughs) which word are you the uh the good the good side not the bad side anu anu Anu. i'm sorry thank you thank you t-rex and and rob they're here and i'm like all right it starts with an a which one is it (laughs) Yeah, yeah. On, on Anu Padme. and yeah, yeah. Padme, like that she might be somehow like if imagine those two things as like orbs that, that come in contact with each other. Well, they must have existed within something. Right. And maybe right. she is the darkness or the manifestation of the darkness in between the two of them or something like that. There's this weird speculation about like all of like, how does she actually fit into all of that? Um, and, and here's the thing that I th- that I want to throw out there. I've got I've, of course, I've got some crazy ideas. Here's the crazy idea. She is darkness, but she's also the shadow. What happens? Where do shadows exist? Shadows exist where darkness and light overlap. Does that make sense? So if you think about it, you can't have shadows without light in order to cause something. Something occludes the light and behind the thing standing there creates the shadow. The shadow is the place where you can see and it's not completely black no shadow is completely black because there's always light that bounces in and around the item it just occludes the direct light right so what if nocturnal is what happens when the void when darkness and nothingness itself butts up against something Right. What if nocturnal is the necessary creation of the formation of th- things at all? Sure. Which like she's the boundary between darkness and light, which mostly looks like shadow. And and, <laughs> right. and when and when you exist in the light, like any any legitimate being, you you are a light thing, right? You are a thing of creation. You are a thing that came from the light. She's going to look dark in contrast. She's going to look like the darkness because she is shadow. Right. right. So that's interesting. And also the other, <clears throat> if we're going on this whole uh, idea of, you know, the Anu and Padme thing, um, what, one thing that's kind of interesting, just, just from that perspective, as we talked about originally was where we had mentioned that nocturnal always seems to be um, in the feminine form throughout the series, mm-hmm. but when you deal with uh the dread father it's very much the opposite side of that yes so it'd be kind of interesting if there is a tie in there maybe that's actually not true but it's never under the same name type of thing you know what i mean like maybe there is another side to that but it's so different that you kind of don't make that connection the rest of the time yeah yeah maybe 
Maybe. I mean, there might be something there. And I, yeah, I don't it, know for sure that there is. This is one of this is like right, it, the boundary exactly. of like I mean, the what in if game. Right? She's never literally referred to as anything else. But it's just the fact that it's like, OK, well, they, there's the potential if there's like that tie in there type of deal. Yeah. Rob, the princess in chat clearly has a thing for her. Um, he, well, said, he says it, she always takes the feminine form because she is mommy. <laughs> that's all see, it is. And there, there you go. And I mean, there <laughs> that's canon. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Twiggy asks, uh, are all the Daedric Princes technically genderless? Yes, they are all yeah, yeah, they are yeah. all beyond the limitations of physical creation and the creation of species like men and elves and and everybody else. They have genders because they have the physical need to procreate and all of that. Right. Um, they have physical bodies, so they yeah. have to have some sort of form to be in those physical bodies. These creatures, Daedric Princes, by definition, don't need to have physical forms. They choose to. And in, right. and in being able to choose to, they can pick the form that they want. And so they pick forms that affect and relate to the societies that and the people that they're interacting with. So there's definite intentionality in the way they pick their forms and how they come across, either because they seek to manipulate or they seek to be welcome among or whatever, right? Like there's right. a reason why like Molek Ball looks so scary. Right. Because the idea he is wants to, be, to terrify those and he wants like to terrify people. or you're, you know, Hermaeus Moore and don't give an F like it's just like <laughs> just wants to be a blob of eyes, right? <laughs> an eye blob. Snappy claws and smoke and eyes and tentacles. <laughs> sure. sure. So they, they pick the form that they want in order right. to be and, and project a certain image on mortals. Um, so here, let's before we get to the mid break, we got to talk about the Thieves Guild. Clearly, the Thieves Guild worship nocturnal like they yeah, do the most their concrete work. tie in of a guild in the series directly to nocturnal yeah like there are worshipers there are people who but she's basically like doesn't pay them any attention so there's not tons of them that are outwardly acting on it like putting on like cows and calling themselves worshipers of nocturnal but right. secretly she has many followers many people anybody who seeks to use the night to their benefit use the darkness to their benefit in some ways is worshiping nocturnal specifically the thieves guild who are very open about this yep so you come across that. I think this is one of the things that anybody at this point who's played Skyrim in the last 10 years has done the Thieves Guild quests, understands the relation to the Nightingales and the items and those kinds of things. Right. And it's where that concept of her being Lady Luck or having the tie into the lucky factor comes in, mm -hmm. because, again, like without I mean. I, I'm pretty sure everybody has or has an idea of it, but you never know. But without going into the entire storyline of the Thieves Guild in Skyrim yeah. specifically, um, the idea is that since, you know, Nocturnal was essentially slighted by her artifact, which we'll get into her artifacts uh, after the break, mm -hmm. the artifact is missing, i.e. it wasn't protected by the Nightingales. You know, story revolves around that. Because that is missing, she's not giving them her favor so their contracts have dried up they keep botching all the contracts that they do get like it's just the thieves guild is basically on hard times because they're not so great so that's <laughs> right. just they're it. a mess and, when that, you get and there. that's i was gonna say <laughs> i'm really glad that rob brings it up because it's, it's my favorite thing to call them in skyrim where they just kind of devolve into the thugs guild because they don't even know how to thieve anymore they just rough up store owners and like <laughs> you know g give us your septums because we we can't pinch your purse when you're not paying attention we fell down the stairs into a <laughs> bunch of pots and pans on the way there so yeah, we're basically the bad mafia <laughs> yeah exactly, yes. we're just bad at the being the mafia. yes we're just bad at being the mafia <laughs> right right so yeah so there's the connections there that makes a lot of sense um and and then there's witches like this is another thing is that um instead of having i mean they, they do have a temple in skyrim where people worship nocturnal but it's very rare unlike some of these other daedra where they have temples all over the place not so much most most societies don't condone the worship of nocturnal and you know say oh did you go praise nocturnal today like that's not a part of the culture it's not a part of the dun mary culture like any of the any of the ones that go out on a limb she's not really associated with but then you have witches and witches specifically many of them because they use the darkness and the night and these kinds of uh, uh, motifs, I guess you could say, are 
typically considered to be worshipers of nocturnal. So that's kind of the the main overview of all of it without getting too deeply into any one of the the sections. Um, any other thoughts before we move on? Thank our patrons. Um, no. Well, OK. The only other thing that I think is maybe worth noting, because it being the most, um, I don't know, mo- most prominent in the series at the moment, just because it's the live service game that exists. Um, she has a huge tie in to more than one expansion of the elder scrolls online. Uh, it actually spans several expansions. It's a very, very, it, it, I want to keep it somewhat vague, but also give information. So basically (laughs) her major plot line was before the uh, elder scrolls online kind of changed their format into having a season, which is one year encompass a complete storyline. It kind of was one long running story to start the series for the first couple of years. Like it, 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 you didn't even see how some of the things were going to tie in for a while. Mm -hmm. And she ended up being a major factor in the closing of that part of one of the uh, expansions. And it's kind of like, for lack of a better term, it's like a danger triad of, are they actually cooperating? Because data currencies are notorious for not cooperating. Yeah. If they're getting Um, along, that means it's no good for anybody. (laughs) That's an, it's not a good sign for anybody. Right. Right. Um, and it's hard to direct you specifically to that storyline if that is something of interest to you. But basically, the conclusion of all of that is in Somerset, and you have a mm-hmm. lot of dealings with Nocturnal, and the storyline goes in some pretty interesting directions. It's very cool and shows that even though it tend, it, she, she'll often tend to try to stay in the shadows she has her own objectives along with the rest of them trying to get done what she wants to get done. It's mm-hmm. a very good storyline. And uh, not a lot of them. She's not a prominent antagonist in the series. Like, so it, it was interesting to see her in a major, not necessarily villain role at points, but it, for lack of influential better, a villain role, antagonist, like, an antagonist. Yeah, an antagonist. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it, it was interesting to have her be less of a side Daedric Prince, like doing her own thing, like Hermes Mora tends to be. Mm-hmm. Like some of them are a little more neutral than Molag Ball and stuff like that. And she played a pretty major role in the Somerset expansion, which, uh, you know, if it, as we have many, many fans of Nocturnal, if you haven't played that expansion, <laughs> definitely recommend. Yeah. And you get to go to her realm. You get to see more of like yep. the creatures and the t- type of Daedra that are involved. With yes. All of that. Uh, same um, thing with the Clockwork City expansion. Uh, it's, a, it's a DLC expansion chapter. You get some touches uh, of going into Everglobe there as well. And you get uh, to see true. some of the realm. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot yep. about that. Yeah. 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 Well, cool stuff. Yeah, she well, spans quite a few of her, her influence in there. Yeah. Yeah. She She's a cool one. I mean, like she is, you, you know, if you're into the whole emo, like dark, spooky yes. thing, and she's cool. I actually, I guess this wouldn't really, it don't seem to actually. Oh, no, never mind. We'll get into it. I was going to say, I was like, I don't see it in the. Never mind. We'll get into it later after Artifacts. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> stay tuned for that. Uh, we'll be back. We're going to talk about Artifacts and more stuff. But first, we have to thank our patrons. This is Hamish Morak, Dragonborn, and you are educating yourself to the Elder Scrolls lore cast. All right, here we are in the middle of the show. We've got some new patrons to call out. And uh, it's been, dude, it's been a little while. Um, We were here (laughs) last week, uh, but I think the last ones I called out were Aiden W, maybe Bennett F. Otherwise, you're getting a call at a second time. Welcome. Thank you for signing up. Still thank you. Still (laughs) thank you. We also have Ben F, Coldwater, uh, Ving, Ving with two I's, V-I-I-N-G. Oh, all right. Um, I'm going to mess this up. Nervigan, Space Wolf. N R W G N Space Wolf, all one word. And um Pillar Day uh Pillar D 
and Jake T. Sorry. There we go. That's everybody. Welcome to the Patreon. I'm glad you guys are here. And thank you to all of you for helping to support the show. I really appreciate it. We're down to 99. We've had some of our tier fives drop off because they probably signed up for those first like 90 episodes. They got what they wanted. They moved on. Absolutely. Totally, totally cool. Thank you for that's it, that. That's why you set it up like that. Yeah. Thanks for coming. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed your time with free episodes and those, those kinds of things. Um, but we also have to thank our Daedric Princes, Kira and Noodle Al Dente. Thank you so much for your support and all the rest of you guys, all the different tiers. Um, big news, Lotus. We're actually we got a few things to announce in the middle of this. I was episode, say, so don't don't go anywhere. It's going to be a little uses. bit. We don't have any reviews to read out. So this is going to take the spot of the reviews. Leave a review if you'd like to help us out. Apple Podcasts, yeah, give us side, a rating. I was going to say, no <laughs> worded reviews, but I actually just, when I was going through organizing just setups and stuff like that, just because I noticed it from Tales as well, uh, the other podcast I do, mm-hmm. uh, it, even though there aren't any written ones, thank you for all the five stars because yes. like it just gives you the number. So oh, absolutely, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Job. If you don't want to write something and have it read out on the show, just drop a rating. A five star yeah. rating is amazing and super helpful on on both Apple and Spotify. So whatever you listen right. to, if you listen on either of those, even if you don't listen on those, if you have the app, <laughs> you just want to go in and drop us a rating. That would be awesome. Um, it still counts. Like you're still listening to the show, right? Like it still helps people find it. So that's right. that's very helpful. So, um, so yeah. Yeah, thank you. To, thank you to the uh, unnamed stars. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to say thank you directly, but that's the mo- that's the best we can do right now. Um, so here's the thing. We're in the mm, second week of August. The shirts for our patrons and the sticker. So if you're tier three, you get stickers. If you're tier four, you get shirts. And those started at the beginning of September last year, which means there are four shirts. You get one every three months as long as you stay subscribed they're each daedric princes and we're going alphabetically through them like we've been doing with these episodes and they're designs that i've put together myself and a lot of people love them everybody shows off the shirts when they get them that's coming to an end but that doesn't mean that you still can't get the year one shirts if you act soon before the end of the month so if you are interested in getting those shirts, you can actually get double shirts if you sign up within the next few weeks, because what that means is it will put you on track every three months to get the year one shirts, which you can still get through the next year as long as you sign up now. If you sign up in September, then those shirts go away. That also means that since you have signed up for, say, tier four to get the shirts, if you stay on and you're getting the tier one shirt, the, the first year of shirts, that means you're going to start getting the second year of shirts starting next month. So three months after September begins, you'll get the first of those shirts. So you'll end up getting like a shirt, every, like a shirt a month. And then it's like, so, so I think it would actually, so if you signed up right now, it would be like, you'd get a shirt in November and a shirt in December, skip a month, a shirt in February, a shirt in March. So like every three months for the first year and then every three months for the second year. Does that make sense? I think so. So if you want to get the tier one shirts, you have to sign up or the year one, not tier one, year one shirts, man, this is confusing. You have to sign up now before that goes away. If you do, you'll start also getting year two shirts once those start rolling out in the next few months if that makes sense if you only sign up next month then you you can't get the year one shirts anymore but you will start getting the year two shirts does that make sense <laughs> yes but ron's response i got lost after you said shirt <laughs> i said shirt way too many times um if you have any questions write me on the discord send me a note on on twitter whatever i'll help clear it up uh if you go to he will make a flow chart i'll make you. a flow chart it's really not that complicated i think i just made it too complicated um if you go to <laughs> patreon.com slash elder scrolls lorecast i reposted the designs of the first the first set of four shirts so you can see them if that's something you want um it starts with azura and it moves forward you get there's like you know clavicus vile there's it ends with hermaeus mora which i think is my favorite still and then starting in september you'd start getting the second set of shirts which i posted on the discord i will share those on the patreon soon i think the designs are awesome i'm still jealous that i can't have them i would concur they are very well done it's almost like the artist of them is very good at making shirts i uh, this is just a side thing i don't like i put them out there and then people are like those look really awesome and i'm like thanks i'm not i don't consider myself a graphic artist but I appreciate it. So, well, my, my YouTube channel art, uh, from a lot of my screens is due to you as well. So I'd say you're quite good at it. (laughs) Maybe maybe you tinker around stuff long enough. Maybe you get okay. Um, but I hope you guys enjoy them. I, 
this is one of those things that I just, it, I know I would want them. So I'm hoping you guys do too. It's that kind of thing. Like I'm tempted to just make my own and order my own shirts. Um, so go check those out. They're awesome. Uh, and the other thing is I'm no longer doing the multi-stream thing. I tried that out for a while. I think it just confused people. So I'm back to streaming primarily on Twitch. So if you'd like to join us for the live show, we're still at the same time, Thursday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, and twitch.tv slash robots radio. And if you want to sub or drop some bits or whatever, you can do the Twitch thing. And I'm going to try and stream a little bit more often again doing games and those kinds of things. And so I'm thinking maybe Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays during the days, if I can, maybe in the evenings on occasion um, when I'm not doing a show that kind of stuff so lots of stuff going on if you have any questions about any of that stuff just send me a note or post something on the discord how about we do the rest of the show sounds good all right here we go you're listening to the elder scrolls lore cast dear child of cities that is why the night mother loves you yeah, I could totally make one for myself. I could yeah, totally I just say, make them and order them. We were asking, but it breaks the rules. Own? It well, breaks it's like it doesn't I mean, make like, it special anymore. This is like well, special just for you guys. Well, that and I was going to say is from my understanding of like the way these things are distributed. It's like it's kind of weird to subscribe to our own Patreon. So <laughs> yeah, like, I could, could like. We, I could I mean, subscribe we, to my own it, Patreon, right? Right, because then it would put us on the distribution thing. But then it's mm -hmm. like, well, at that point, we could just make one on like a site that looks the same and just send it to ourselves. Yeah, there's like a <laughs> hundred different T-shirt maker sites where you could just like right. order one so shirt. Like, sure. Yeah. But yeah, the, the default way that they're distributed doesn't really make sense <laughs> unless we subscribe to ourselves. Yeah, that's a little weird. Um, but... <laughs> But anyway, uh, but no, it's supposed to be special. It's supposed to be just for everybody, everybody else. That way, you know that like you got these, they were limited edition. Nobody else has them. Nobody else can get them later. It's all just a special thing. So um, anyway, hey, we've got artifacts to talk about, Lotus. We do. You're our the artifacts are always my favorite. Artificer. Which one do you want to start with? All right. So let's start. The Nocturnal has some good ones. Um, some mm -hmm. really, really gameplay tangible super game breaky good ones <laughs> yeah yeah um, so these are these tend to actually be it's not even just one of them is my favorite she has a few that are actually my favorite um probably the most notable one is the skeleton key which has been in several games um the skeleton key is basically it probably is my favorite Daedric artifact uh, in, in game, at least in terms of usefulness. Mm -hmm. Until you get um, really good at just picking locks. Well, it, it is. And uh, sometimes the thing is, though, <laughs> you can just sell all your other lock picks once you have this thing. Because even if you True. suck, you can just have this one lock pick forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you never have to worry about carrying other ones. But basically uh, what it is is the skeleton key, it's an artifact of Nocturnal. Uh, in Woof, why, what is that? What? That is... What? I'm trying to read. I was... Did you I mess up your screen? No, I'm... <laughs> that's... Uh, yeah, I, I accidentally did screw up my... I, like, overlapped two screens together, and I was like, what is happening? Sorry. Anyway. Here, I, I can read about it real quick if you need help. Yeah, kick off that while I fix this. Yeah, yeah, so... Uh, it's common. The skeleton key is, key is commonly um, connected to Nocturnal, although there are some Kajidi myths that say it originally belonged to Azura. There we go. And you know what we didn't mention in the first part is that some of those same myths believe that Nocturnal and Azura are like sister siblings. Yeah. It's like light and darkness thing going on. I don't know how much I believe that. We're just going to leave that on the I, side, but it's uh, all it's notable. It's notable. Uh, yeah. Um, so it goes on it says in appearance the skeleton key doesn't always take the form of a key and sometimes manifests as a lock pick instead in its key form it can be used to unlock any lock as a lock pick it is nigh unbreakable and can get past even the toughest locks the two limitations placed on the key by wizards who sought to protect their storehouses were that the key <laughs> could only be used once a day and it would never be the property of one thief 
for too long, eventually disappearing. And we've talked about these Daedric artifacts just kind of disappearing on occasion. And right, and they then don't be falling into the with... hands of somebody else. Yeah, yeah. So it goes on, it says, the artifact functions as a tool for unlocking all things, including portals, hidden potential, and other unknown possibilities. Its ultimate that's... function... Before you go, yeah. that's something that I love, is that theoretically like you think of this in a very tangible it's a skeleton key like those exist in real life they're not really quite the same as the, now as they were back sure, in the day sure but the idea of a skeleton key exists because it's like the it, it can drop the pins to a certain thing and open multiple locks which is cool but the idea that this can do the unlocking of many things including potential of magic people yeah like, human potential <laughs> like, that's really where that thing gets weird <laughs> yes yes so it goes on it says its ultimate function however is to unlock and open the ebon mirror a portal to nocturnal's realm Evergloom. the Eb- ebon mirror is a location inside the shrine in, in skyrim um Located in the, it's called the Twilight Sepulchre. The Nightingales are tasked with guarding the sepulchre and retrieving the key should it be stolen. Unfortunately, the prince is said to allow the skeleton key to be stolen or lost periodically, whether by purpose or by apathy. We don't know. Yeah. It always struck me as kind of a test more than apathy, but... You know, that's mm-hmm. also from a gameplay standpoint, um, very in gamey. Uh, it is literally unbreakable. It's not theoretically unbreakable. It's just you can't break it in game, like which is great because no matter how bad you are at lock picking, you can botch it over and over and over again and it'll allow you to just <laughs> pick locks since it won't break, mm-hmm. which was what I was referring to is you can just get rid of all other lock picks once you have this. The thing is, um, some games like Morrowind, you can just hang on to it for like, I mean, you can generally hang on to it as you would like. However, hanging on to it in Skyrim poses a problem to completing other quests if you don't give it back, um, which is a real conundrum because I don't like giving it back. It's um, very I handy. Want it. Yeah, it's so useful. It's so, so useful. great. Um, so so giving it back makes me feel bad, um, and I don't like that. Yeah. Well, hey, why don't we move on to the bow of shadows? Because this is another Skyrim yes. focused item. So, the bow of shadows. Uh, now that my screen is fixed, is <laughs> another Daedric artifact. Uh, according to legend, was forged by the Daedric Prince Nocturnal, uh, the legendary rain, ranger uh, Reg- Relalis, Rare, rareless, rareless. Yeah, I think it's rareless. Guile um, was granted the bow for a secret mission that failed. The bow was lost, though. Regalus uh, is said to have used it to take scores of his foes down with him. The bow is said to grant indi- uh, invisibility and increased speed, which is interesting because again, it's one of those things that um, was again staying in the shadows is the mm-hmm. idea of the bow, which feeds into the sneaky archer gimmick that is very very well known in the series um the one thing i will say this has been seen in several different games it's been in morrowind and uh skyrim however the one thing i do specifically want to bring up about this one before we just move past it because that's really all there is to it it's a fancy bow um is this also makes an appearance in the elder scrolls adventures red guard which is your <laughs> of course it does. fact of the episode. Sweet. Um, yeah. Uh, whereas there is a dark elf <clears throat> assassin bodyguard for, you know, named drum that you will battle uh, throughout the series. And uh, yeah, he, he's actually wielding the bow of shadow in that game. So that's, that's really the important bit, obviously, because I'm sure that's Elder Scrolls fun to Adventures deal with red guard. <laughs> yeah. That sounds super fun to fight against. <laughs> yeah, no, he's great. And he, the voice acting is great. So anyway, <laughs> every character that, in the game, except for like the one of them sounds oh, like, like Silas, who is like the best voice actor. <laughs> Yeah. They all sound like <laughs> like dying chickens. Yes, um, everybody is wheezing and gasping for breath, <laughs> except for Silas, who is awesome. <laughs> right, right. All right. Um, which one do you want to do next? So <clears throat> we haven't hit my one, favorite yet. I'm sure you can probably pick which one's my favorite. So I would assume maybe it's the Gray Cowl of Nocturnal. Yes. Would that be your favorite? Yes. Because that is another awesome one and a contender for one of my favorites as well. And the way it plays into the Thieves Guild stuff in Oblivion. Yes. Very cool. It is. Um, 
So the gray cowl of nocturnal is a data card effect that obviously blocked a nocturnal. Uh, it takes the form of a dark leather cowl. It's not really super dark. It's grayish, but whatever, uh, which obscures the face of the wearer. Nocturnal is uh, revered as a god of thieves amongst Terrio, as we had brought up earlier. Her <laughs> reputation as the mistri- mistress of shadows has sometimes led the thief led thieves to attempt to steal an item from her to prove their greatness, which is also kind of interesting that she becomes the mark so that people can prove that they're that good of a thief they rip off their own god yeah yes Uh, Mm -hmm. that's probably got some interesting consequences if it doesn't go so well yeah Um, either she's impressed or she's not or she's really pissed (laughs) she's really not (laughs) yeah um as nocturnal is usually depicted as wearing a cloak and a cowl uh it is around these two items that the legend the legends have arisen uh the story of the theft of nocturnal's cowl is probably that of fiction uh as there is at least one story of the theft of the cowl but the cowl is uh has been known to leave her possession. So that's like a thing is other people do gain use mm-hmm. of this. So whether or not people actually steal it from her or whether it's bestowed to people is kind of like where the legend comes into play. Right. right. And, and, and to kind of, I don't know, cut to the chase on this one, it makes yeah. your identity unknown. People are just know you by the cowl and no longer by who you are. Correct. And the thing that's very cool about this, because this is uh, appeared in Elder Scrolls for Oblivion, and it is super great because it will actually reset your stats based on you being the gray fox which was yeah the that's the thief title. known right uh for wearing the gray cowl mm-hmm. and basically when you put on this cowl or somebody else puts on this cowl their actual identity is obscured so that everybody just thinks it's that like that's just the gray fox um and it resets your stats to a crazy high infamy from the gray fox but at the same time if you can commit crimes and then get into an alley and take off the hood, nobody knows you did the crime. Right, so it's right. It's really effective yeah. in game. I'm bad um, <clears throat> the only side effect I will say of that before we move past that one is the gray cowl actually can have some bad side effects to overuse in game. Um, one big problem is try not to, or, uh, you know, it, I'm sure there's add ons to f- correct it, but in stock, standard vanilla oblivion don't talk to too many quest givers with the cowl on you because it will obscure your identity to the point that the game will sometimes lose track of your character model doing the things that they did uh one of my friends actually corrupted his uh thieves guild playthrough by talking to somebody with it them not realize like referring to him as like oh okay and they walked out of the conversation because he had a high bounty and walked off into the sunset and he could (laughs) never find them again or complete his quest oh no (laughs) it worked too well yeah so it worked a little too well because they didn't think he apparently ever returned with the completion of his quest nice yeah so So, be careful it might work too well um yeah but definitely cool one i remember playing through that and not knowing what was going to happen and and discovering pieces of it as, as you went and being like wow this is actually really cool yeah i i just the other thing that i really like about that is it gave you detect life which is like mm-hmm. i feel an underplayed thing in that game because it made it real easy to f- follow people's patterns uh where right. they were going and stuff like that or see things cool. in the dark when you were being a sneaky oh, archer yeah. exactly you didn't need a giant torch to light your way when you just followed the little pink mist trail to where the people were so i feel like very, oblivion very, very was cool darker idea. than skyrim too like I the dungeons agree. are kind of self-lit in skyrim i have to use mods to make them feel dark yes but there are places in oblivion like some of those alien ruins and, and places where they weren't gems shining right that felt like these dark corners of these rooms and and like if there was a monster in there you wouldn't be able to see it necessarily until it came out at you yep yeah so that would be nice um note note to bethesda when you, as you're working on this next Elder Scrolls game, maybe actual dark, not all of them, but maybe some of the dungeons make but them real some dark. Darkness, yeah, make them real some dark. Darkness, make light necessary, you know, <laughs> or detect life or whatever. Um, 
so we've got two more that are much less known than the three that we just dealt with. Uh, the next one is the eye of nocturnal, uh, which is an item of note and it, uh, little is known of the items origin or abilities other than that it was stolen by two argonians in the third era 433 and sub subsequently returned to the prince in exchange for the skeleton key nocturnal described uh, herself as being able to see from the eye stating that when the thieves stole it she was able to see them with the artifact which is like it's a drone it's okay, a yeah nocturnal it's, it's, drone yeah it's it's exactly so you attach some wings to it and you fly it around and it's, it's great <laughs> right right sell it to amazon it'll deliver your packages um, package d delivered by nocturnal yes nocturnal <laughs> delivery service <laughs> and then the final item is the shade sickle which is said to be created by the bretons uh the blade of the sickle has a unique ability to separate the living from their shadows which sounds weird um those struck by the blade uh slowly and gradually were stripped of their ability to think consciously and turned into hapless beings akin to thralls it's associated with nocturnal which is kind of why it's tied to her even though it was a breton creation um and was a powerful in uh, instrument of her will despite its common appearance the blade was premature uh pr i prematurely don't know what that what is that word what uh it was prematurely Se pred preternaturally preternaturally that's preternaturally that word i've never heard that yes uh, okay yeah yeah like uh like impossibly like yeah i was gonna say just from context yeah. okay cool well i just learned a new word preternaturally yeah. fantastic sharp <laughs> and uh <laughs> filled those uh who gaze at it with a deep sense of foreboding i mean i guess if it's so sharp it kind of bends reality that seems like uh it it, it would be a little foreboding to look at yeah that's pretty messed up um yeah this is a eso item i believe I think this uh, one is, only yeah, shows it? up in ESO. Uh, Blackwood has oh, something to do okay. with, with one of the quest lines in there. Blood Run Cave. Yeah. That kind of stuff. Th yeah, this is a literal side quest. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yep. Some of these little side quest things are hard to remember. Even though you play them all, it's like, which one was that? There's Where so was many of them. There's a lot. There's a yep. lot of them. So there was something else you wanted to tap into. So the only other thing that I really wanted to tap into and I made uh, reference to earlier is kind of her servants as she has some interesting servants. Each of the Daedric Princes kind of have their own little gang of thieves so to speak um and she's got some rather interesting ones uh in in terms of the uh suggestiveness that we were joking about earlier in attire uh <laughs> there are the nocturnal shrikes uh, which are often called the nocturnals or shrikes you can kind of split it into either one wasn't that like a 50s doo-wop band the nocturnals uh, well I don't I know mean, for sure. I'm making a joke, but it, it, it sounds you like no, actually, um, I feel like they might have been exiled from the 50s because basically <laughs> they just wear a skirt. Uh, that's all they've got. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe so, they sing in the still of the night. That's, yeah. the, that's the song they sing. Nice. Yeah. But in a very haunting um, kind of way, a very yeah, minor so, key. They're, uh, they have even less attire on than nocturnal in games and their hair is very strategically yeah. placed. <laughs> yeah. They, they're kind of the most booba, uh, characters in ESO. They really are. Um, I don't know who got that across, uh, who the designer for that one was, but they yeah. are a voluptuous enemies. <laughs> it, it definitely, uh, it definitely kind of gives off the vibe of some of the characters from elder scrolls battle spire as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. which you actually do deal with some daedra that also just a hair covering specific places or not yeah uh yeah or not at all because battle spire is really took advantage of that m rating for yeah. the 90s for um, adults yeah so because so adults just can't, FYI, are the only ones who can see nipples much, even though uh, everybody yeah. has a nipple correct um society is so strange but yeah <laughs> it's a little weird um but yeah so like there's definitely some tie in to references with the Shrikes kind of finding their formation in Elder Scrolls Battle Spire uh, and then kind of becoming solidified as the series goes on in Elder Scrolls Online, where you deal with Shrikes quite frequently. Um, there's also Grievous Twilights, Gloam Knights, uh, the Wraith of Crows, which 
really the Wraith of Crows is very, very creepy. Um, he's kind of like a decomposing crow and the the lankiness of him. And if you've ever seen one of those plague doctor masks, that's uh, very similar to what its face looks like, except yeah. it's not a mask. It's the actual creature itself. Right, right. The beak. Yeah. Y- yeah. And then um, what do you call it? The the other one that I really wanted to specifically just kind of bring up is the Crow Court, which is they're a group of sentient crows uh, in the Elder Scrolls Online. Uh, they, they're <laughs> yes. kind of comic yes. relief. <laughs> oh, I love these. I, I'm, you know, having watched Sandman recently... Yep. And the talking Matthew, the talking crow. Okay. I have to wonder if that wasn't some inspiration here for the court of crows. Possibly. I mean, this does occur in other mythology too. The idea sure. of like a talking crow is, is a very old concept, but yes. Uh, kind of cool. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the, <laughs> there's definitely, I uh, and people definitely kind of reiterate the fact. Yeah. The, the crow court uh, is definitely kind of like become a fan favorite because they're, they're pretty goofy. Their quests are <laughs> yes. very entertaining because they act like crows. Um, they remember the have... pigeons from Animaniacs. Yes, I do. That's these guys. There you... yes, yes, that is them. Yes. Um, so they, you know, they squawk and fight amongst each other. Um, it's a lesser known thing, although it's uh, several years old now. So I, it's you know, if if you haven't found it, I guess this is how you will know it exists. But. Um, they they make appearances now throughout the series other than just they they had a couple base game appearances very specifically if you go to the stone falls public dungeon uh that they're that's where their storyline really takes effect Mm -hmm. but the crows are also in the uh, clockwork city expansion which i had made reference to earlier where you kind of encounter Everglow. well after completing a certain amount of quests they will give you a repeatable uh quest in which you basically need to appease the crow court by acting like a crow uh-huh. and yeah. crows like shiny objects so you need to acire the random garbage that the crows want to build their house out of yes i remember as this. part of your dailies and it is it's actually rather difficult for a daily to do because they're very specific on which types of trash they want but it's a very funny concept that they are literally having you do their crow bidding to build their nest mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah it's good stuff it's it's definitely worth playing through yeah they're, they're, yeah. they're funny and they have a deck of cards now in the new tales of tribute oh yeah that, that's true yeah 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 lots of lots of crow court love lots of crow court love well we're at the end of the show so yeah. we get to talk about some of the uh the weird quirky things and uh, not too many weird quirky, although 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 we got to talk voice actors and there's definitely a voice actor connection here which i think is worth noting due to the topic so first there's two voice actors the first one is from oblivion katherine fly i think f-l-y-e i think that's how you pronounce katherine's name katherine fly uh not not a huge list of credits get this there's morrowind played some female characters in morrowind pirates of the caribbean video game townspeople one elder scrolls oblivion and shivering isles right same game expansion right yep other than that one role in a uh, movie potentially in 1986 and then was also in the tv series girls huh huh interesting but this is the more interesting thing the other voice actor lonnie uh minella has played lots of characters like video game characters all over the place multiple characters every year has been in like everything you will you will know this voice if you hear it you'll hear it in multiple games and be like that voice sounds familiar this is one of those voices she not only played nocturnal in skyrim but also voiced the night mother hmm dun, dun, dun. was that intentional was that just like oh we like this voice actress and she can do a voice that works for both of these things or 
is there some connection to Nocturnal and the Night Mother? Are they the right. same person? Hmm? Yeah. Was that a design choice or the fact that they like to have 12 people do 2000 characters? Right. Like, is it just a coincidence or yep. is it intentional? Exactly. Might is be intentional. Hermaeus Mora actually the Oblivion Guard? Who is to say? <laughs> who knows uh only todd only todd knows so uh if you're todd and you're listening and you want to write in let us know yeah just because <laughs> clearly you listen to elder scrolls long i'm sure, I'm sure that's how you're time. i'm sure that you're spending all of your valuable time yep um uh but yeah that's i mean that's most of the interesting bits on this one but um uh anything else before we head out nocturne's pretty freaking cool yeah, but no, I think that pretty much covers all of the uh, nocturnal stuff for this episode. Yeah, without going too deep. Well, there's yeah, obviously more say, we again, can get you into. can keep going off on tangents in a million directions with these, but I, yeah. I think that's yeah. good for now. Awesome, awesome. Lotus, uh, I, I got to listen to a little bit of the last Tales episode. You guys were talking about the new update and all <sighs> yeah, of that it's stuff. very chaotic for those of you who play. Um, I, I, the end game idea is just a weird concept. It's just difficult challenges in the game, but it's mm -hmm. referred to as end game. But like end game stuff uh, is a little contentious at the moment in Elder Scrolls Online. It really won't affect like kind of casual storyline play or overworld stuff or anything like that. But if you like progressing like through difficult challenges and stuff like that, <sighs> The direction of the game is taking some weird things as they're trying to try stuff out. It's not landing the way that it seems like it's intended. So um, we, we've been having guests on to discuss it with us and talk with the community and getting feedback and stuff like that and doing our best to uh, provide that information back to the devs so that they can kind of test it against their own ideas and stuff like that. And, and the big thing that we've been really trying to do and specifically choose the guests we do is to do it in a respectful manner because these are video games and some people get really bent out of shape about this stuff. And human beings work on them. Yeah. It's weird. And it's not all of like, those human beings are the decision makers and they're just doing their jobs the best they can. Correct. So. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, I, I love High Isle. Uh, it's actually, now that I've completed it, uh, it is my favorite expansion uh, in the entire series of the Elder Scrolls Online. Uh, it is my favorite chapter. And um, I'm really excited for the new dungeons coming out at the end of August slash beginning of September. But I am unfortunately in the camp who is really not feeling good about the direction of combat. However, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we can have a funky patch for a little while and then hopefully next next patch they'll get in the direction they're aiming for or figure out what they were trying to go to for the long game it's always hard to tell yeah i think uh, i think for stuff. for people who do, one don't work in game design but also don't work in companies that are constantly iterating on their products right. like startups and and in marketing you're even doing this um the the one thing to keep your eye on is the stated goal if they've made a stated goal that you can you can actually measure against then just because the most recent patch doesn't actually get us closer to that goal yes doesn't mean that they're just going to give up with that patch correct especially in game design if there's a stated goal and there's measured progress to that goal then the assumption should be as long as that goal is still the goal that things should progressively get closer even if they take some steps in the wrong direction in order to figure out what's the right way to get there correct so and oftentimes it might be I temporary try to uh you know let people realize that sometimes not knowing their end point things might seem weird along the way but then right. when you get there it makes sense right the the real concern with this without going overly long into all of the fine details you can listen to tales of tamriel if you care about this stuff we go on for at least like in the course of three episodes i believe it's about six hours worth of discussion <laughs> there's on all a lot of this. there's a lot to unpack. Yeah, it's, yeah it's been a lot and we have other guests describing it and stuff like that um but i don't know it's one of those things where i've been quoted uh i guess more than i'm used to on a few specific things where i said well if you do this it mathematically doesn't do this and there were a few situations where that was exactly what they did and i'm like oh no that's not good <laughs> it's like so it's been a little bit of a uh disconnect it seems like with the 
objective cons- compared to what actually happens in practice. Right. So this definitely seems like a bit of a, a bit of a hiccup with how combat is going to be in that direction without either one more information or two, maybe it just didn't have the effect they were hoping for. Right. But right. the thing that why I don't fall apart at the seams over this is if it to the most extreme, it plays oh, it's fine. Worst case scenario happens. It plays like total crap. Okay, <laughs> fine. Whatever. They can adjust it the way they just adjusted it to bring it here. The next update, they can fix it. Like, cause they're not just going to leave it feeling bad. Like mm-hmm. that, I mean, player retention, that doesn't make sense. And business-wise, that doesn't make sense. Right, they're not right. going to do that. They so, don't They don't want to tank the game. So they're going right. to do, they're, so, eventually, they're going to come around to doing the thing that actually works for the correct. majority of people. So, so worst case scenario, I'm just basically like, okay, well, I think I'm going to play story and overworld and group stuff like that. And I don't yeah. really think, it, they've, they've done so many changes to try to make the game accessible to different groups and add these new things and correct problems and code and all these things. It's become too much for me to keep up with right. and try to progress these incredibly hard challenges. So I'm like, once Good, they do some other down, stuff, I'll get back. Maybe even stuff. play some other games. Um, exactly. Yeah. I was going to say Daggerfall is officially installed. Everybody's been <laughs> nagging me to play that and just suffer on stream. So there you go. There you go. I've That's... got Elden Ring installed as well. Oh, dude. Nice. Because, nice. Yeah. I play things to beat myself up. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Rob and uh, Sam N7 Legend and uh, my friend Chris and I were uh, about a week and a half ago two weeks now because I was on vacation uh, right. playing Elden Ring co-op together on stream. Oh, neat. And that is nuts. Uh, we, we did co-op through a randomizer, which randomized oh all the enemies and all the items. Super weird, but at least you have your buddies there with you. Right. Um, it's a little janky, but it worked and it's nuts. So if, if you want to join us for something like that, I can help get, get you started. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to say, I, I know I, we had discussed the uh, Skyrim one too. Yes. So there's Skyrim, um, Skyrim together, it, which I've got installed as well. Still so janky. I've never tried, but, I haven't fired it up yet, so I don't know if I did it wrong and it's a janky mess, but <laughs> it's going to say it's, it's kind of janky as it is, but it's definitely one of those things that we can play. Um, but hey, that's the other thing is that, you know, I'll be, I'll be trying to stream some more play some more games with people i need to spend more times with other, more time with other humans um so <laughs> <laughs> i get lonely guys i work in a house by myself um so yeah come out to my streams twitch.tv slash robots radio for that go check out tales of tamriel it's available on all your podcatchers uh and go check out my other podcasts if you like fallout the fallout lore cast if you like lord of the rings lotus the lord of the rings lore cast like is now real well it's a holy holy mother of god <laughs> it is the fastest growing podcast i've ever done it get this we know that this podcast has a big audience yeah last week it got more downloads than this podcast there you go like that's like lord of the rings is it's, popular stuff it's not people we, have been the so Amazon series right around the corner yeah like yeah people have been so complimentary about it like uh, saying such kind things and the man the community is amazing um so go check that stuff out uh put out a lot of content out there for you guys and all of it's free if you want it so just go get it um but thanks for being here thank lotus thanks for being here chat thank you yeah. for being here as well always happy to see guess, all of you guys um, in there only thing we should say, QuakeCon's right around the corner. Oh, yeah, there's one more. That's the, there there's too many things thing. going on. Uh, yeah, it's so a, it's almost like there's a lot of stuff happening. <laughs> uh-huh. uh-huh. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, so uh, last year we got to do a segment for QuakeCon where uh, we did a quiz show. And so they wrote us again and they were like, hey, you guys want to come back? And we're like, yeah, absolutely. So we have a uh, some different guests this time, some streamers that you might recognize. I'm going to leave all this for fun in order to make sure you guys just log in and see what, what's going on. It will be on noon on Friday. So Friday, the I guess that's next week, isn't that the 19th? Yeah. Is so, it noon or one? Well, I'm sorry. One Eastern noon uh, central. <laughs> beautiful uh, 10 pacific whatever however that works out right Perfect. so it's in the middle of the day on friday on the there's multiple channels that you can watch quakecon stuff on there's there's a calendar on the quakecon website just go look it up we'll put it up on the twitter we'll put it up on twitter we'll put it up on the discord you guys will be able to find yep. it uh lotus goes up against two streamers two well-known eso streamers about high aisle questions where they have to try to lie to each other in order to convince themselves of either not being the truth or being the truth when it's not it's it's a ton of fun 
you guys are yep. going to love it. Um, we're excited it for was, you guys to see it. It was super fun to record, and uh, hopefully, I'm able to redeem myself after losing to Arimithius on the final question last time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just have to tune in to find out. Yep. <laughs> find out who wins. Um, but yeah, it, it's it, and it, it's a close one. It came down pretty close, I think, if I recall, until about the last question. Anyway, yeah, go like check that. it out. It's a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go tune into that stuff. And uh, thanks for being here, everybody. We will see you next time. Stay safe out there. See you guys Bye, later. Everybody. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to hear from you. You can reach me on Twitter at robots underscore radio or Lotus of Doom at Lotus of Doom. Also, you can join us on the Robots Radio Discord channel. You can easily just search Robots Radio Discord on Google or check the description underneath the podcast. Also, this podcast is recorded live every week on Thursday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific on the Robots Radio channels on Twitch, YouTube, and on Facebook. So just search Robots Radio on any of those platforms come join us we'd love to chat with you while we record the show or before or after either way just come hang out with us and if you're looking for more information about my shows and the shows on the robots radio network go to robotsradio.net for all the information about all the shows on the network including the robots radio rocket club where i help both new and existing podcasters to grow their shows build their audiences and create the best podcast they possibly can all of that at robotsradio.net we'll see you next time